want to know what were your influences, movies or books, uh, while you were making this movie? I don't read books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I personally love like uh, when a group of people are stuck in one location, like Night Living Dead or Assault on Precinct 13, and they have to work together to get out. I'm saying you ripped off John Carpenter. <laughs> the funny thing is, I thing? knew that I was ripping off John Carpenter, yet I'd never seen Assault on Precinct 13. I was like, because of that, I'll never watch it. And then as a treat, when I finished the second draft of the script, I was like, oh fuck, I want to watch it. I was very su surprised. To, like, I didn't find a lot of the specific plot elements to be similar, but of course, the, I mean, the siege scenario was the main thing. What I loved about it was the, the texture. Holy shit. I mean, it's like, what a fun movie. It is a straight up exploitation movie. And it, it, it is not ashamed. And I was like, oh, I'm empowered now. Because that's a classic film. I just watched it and it's just bare bones, exploitation and gritty and fun and just didn't try to be more than it was. Um, so, yeah, and, that, and John Carpenter is the thing too. The way he can really create tension and tension in such a with an ensemble cast and a very enclosed environment. It was awesome, and the makeup effects. So I think John Carpenter would be a huge influence. Um, Peckinpah too, that, that was a, uh, probably the primary influence was just straw dogs, um, because it was just real people in this seed situation they had to overcome odds, but it wasn't a horror movie. It was a survival movie. Um, but then, then there's like a whole bunch of influences that are just a collection of everything I've ever watched. I usually reference early Michael Mann I like the, the grounded realism and, the, and also the sort of beautiful sort of synthetic scores. It really turns me on. <laughs> uh, I'm being told we gotta wrap this up, but I got, let me ask you one, one, one last, oh, it's up to me, what was the, are you good? I'm good, I'm good. Okay, all right, let me see what this guy has. He has his hand up, he never asked questions. Desert Island? Black Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yes, right there. Table next to the chair, right by that lamp. Was there not a white landline the entire time in that green room? <laughs> I'm gonna talk to the fucking production designer. <laughs> <laughs> a little, it was a little white phone right when she stuck in her phone. I noticed it because I thought, wow, that was really old. But the entire time I kept going back. I'm like, the phone <laughs> well, there was a scene. In the rafters, and a uh, mouse ate the cord. <laughs> they cut it out because it's pacing. <clears throat> Next question. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 let me get the guy in the back there. Yeah. Um, I've been a fan of yours since Murder Party, and I have always enjoyed uh, punk rock aesthetic in your movies, and there's always been at least a little bit of a sense of humor. Is a sense of humor in your movies uh, something that's important to you? Yeah, I mean, I never, I never really try, but I, I certainly find humor in, uh, in weird places. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have, most of my films to date have very inept protagonists. So when they're flailing, I mean, you can't help but find like that shit's funny. <laughs> but but the, key, the key though is like the characters are never in on it. That, that to me, when they, I don't want to be aware and hammy and this is a joke. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's really funny for me when, when, when you just, as an audience member, you can see with a certain amount of perspective how absurd things are. Um, and once in a while, I'll give a little goose, so I'll, I'll cut it so it's for a comedic beat. But as far as the performances, it's got to be very true. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's also, it's funny for, uh, for us to see people do very human things. Like in Blue Ruin, there's a very standard set up for a self-surgery scene that we've seen a thousand times. And just like, he gets really painful and just cuts to the ER. He's like, fuck it. And he goes to the hospital. And you don't see that often. So that, that sort of thing is really fun to explore, not by like trying to be funny, just like just being real. And, uh, and it, it ends up kind of playing with uh, sort of genre tropes and, and what we're used to seeing, but it's not intentionally so just to say, I'm different than the genre norms. But it does end up being like, if you just put real people in these situations, it gets funny because uh, there's so much relatability 
and mundane horse shit and not like Navy SEAL trade craft, but just like the whole thing of Blue Ruin was like, I just, I thought revenge missions in movies were harder than it was for me to get groceries in Brooklyn. I was like, let me just really dig into the minutia and the things that take time and cleaning up crime scenes. Uh, okay, one of you three, you three duke it out, because you all have your hands up and it looks like you might be together. <laughs> or close. You have the most metal hair. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the middle. Uh, well, it's kind of related to that. Um, what was your, like, music-wise, what was your most influence? Well, you know, a lot of the bands that I grew up in the hardcore punk scene with have songs on screen. So the Ain't Rights, the fictional band, there's, a, there's a, the, the sort of marquee Dead Kennedys cover, Nazi Punk's Fuck Off. But the first song they play in the Mexican restaurant is written by my high school friend, my, my next door neighbor who was in the punk bands with me. And um, the other song they play is written by another friend who was in a band. So these are the songs I loved growing up and was dancing to in the pit like way back when. And uh, this is pre-internet, so it was fun to finally put them in some sort of archive. Um, and that's coupled with like you know Slayer and Bad Brains and Midnight, uh, all kinds of cool bands that, that sort of gave us really generous rates just to be included because it's wall to wall music. Um, but yeah, I think I just I was influenced by the bands in my youth. All right, uh, okay. Uh, wait, but hi. Um, hi, I, I really liked your movie. Thank it was you. Really good. I'm like a big horror movie fan. So I'd like to know what's your favorite scary movie, and if you have a poster, can I have it? Because like I want a poster. <laughs> that I can't answer because it's like it's property of somebody else. Give it to yeah. the director. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it. In, I'll put it in a good word. Uh, scary movies. I mean, I, ooh, a lot of them. I think John Carpenter's The Thing isn't my favorite, but the one that most disturbed me, like many people. Walking down the stairs and creeping into my parents' den as they were watching The Exorcist when I was eight years old freaked me out for probably six or seven years. Crucifix under my pillow. <laughs> um, let me ask you a quick because because I know a lot of the directors who have have uh, a lot of critical success with their first few films lately, like Murder Tr Party. The trend, yeah. <laughs> Like the trend, the trend has been to sort of elevate them to these monster movies. Like, and we've gotten things like Jurassic World and the Star Wars movies. And so, I'm just wondering, have have you had that carrot dangled in front of you, and what has kept you from grabbing it, or or just might you still watching for us? <laughs> watching the shit shows unfold? <laughs> I'm steering clear. Um, no, I think, I think I'm think i also a little older than a lot of those kids that get recruited. Uh, you know, I have, I have a family, I have a house, I'm, I'll be 40 soon, so I don't take the bait. Fuck that, you guys are crazy. You're gonna, you're gonna just, just like churn me up and spit me out, and um, I'm not doing that. Now, there is actually a movie I'm, ta and I'm going for. That being said. That is a studio franchise movie, but it's a really cool one. And I would liken it to like, you know, when Greengrass did the Bourne second, third movies, like that was cool. Those are the kind of studio films that I would love to do because they're grounded actually, and they're realistic and they have a certain aesthetic to it. Um, but I, I, I usually, I like real people. So as long as that's part of the story, it'll be fun. Um, and for now, I, I, I did have opportunities and then I just, I turned back and I was like, holy shit. Like before I try and go classy or big ensemble like studio goat fuck, I'm going to make a movie that I was truly, sincerely think that only I could make at that time. And it's an idea that had been floating around my head for almost a decade. Just the premise, like punk rock band trapped in the green room during a live concert, fending off Nazi skins. That's like my, that's the film I had to make, I had to make, I had to make. And as I grew out of the hardcore scene and became a soft Brooklyn dad, <coughs> big on pastries and that kind of shit, I, I was like, I'm getting too soft, I'm getting too soft, it's gonna get away. So I just gave myself like, I will make Green Room next. 
I don't care if it's stupid. <laughs> it's a bad decision business-wise. Uh, but I, it, it's exciting when you, when you actually think that it's the one film you can make that no one else can at that time. Because I used the momentum from Blue Ruin to make this insane punk rock genre movie. And I'm very happy I did. And it's, I, once you make that big Hollywood thing, it's a little tougher to step back and do something. Like, if you, you might have trouble stepping back and doing this movie once you've done yes. your Marvel movie or whatever. Well, it's also, you, know, you look at Soderbergh, and he's very nimble. And that's, a, that's exciting to know that he, he broke new ground and, and, and did whole new you know, DGA agreements to, to let him go from huge studio films to like sub $100,000 bizarro indies. And I think just having that option would be great because if I do overreach and shit the bed on a big, big movie, I really can pull back and, and make a movie like Blue Ruin again and be fine. Hopefully, you know, I'll build, build back up my street cred. And I'll keep going, you know, I'll keep upping the scale until someone gives me enough downward pressure to say, you're done. Um, guys, if you, like I always say, if you like this movie, a film like this is going to live or die on word of mouth. So if you, and it's, been, it's been a lot of word, word, uh, word of mouth in the last 11 months, but still, a little bit more couldn't hurt. So please tell people for the next couple weeks, it opens April, what is it? 22nd. 22nd. Okay, 22nd. Yeah. So it's a couple weeks. That was a test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Um, and, uh, and Jeremy, thank you so much for coming out and saying hi to you. Thank you all. Thank you guys for sticking around.